Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. For a couple of years now, it's been very clear that AI has a unique and outsized role in the U.S. economy. Anyone who was watching the markets try to resolve and reconcile during the high inflation era as Powell and the Fed tried to rip rates up, move us out of ZERP, and shift into this new paradigm could see that all of the market depressive impacts of those sort of policies were frankly being competed with by AI enthusiasm. Every time there was some geopolitical concern and markets started to wobble, it was AI enthusiasm that brought things back. Now, this is not to say that the narrative has been a steady line. You'll remember about a year ago, we got that piece from Goldman Sachs called Gen AI, Too Much Spend, Too Little Benefit, that was all about how it was ever possible that AI could make as much money back as companies were spending on it. Sequoia's David Kahn also published AI's $600 billion question, which was much the same. At this point, however, a year on, it's very clear that the big tech companies simply do not care about any of those sort of concerns and are going to continue to grow CapEx to compete in what they believe is the most significant shift of our lifetimes. And now we're starting to see AI show up as not just a factor in stock prices and overall market cap, but in broader economic signals as well. Derek Thompson, formerly of The Atlantic, wrote, So GDP is only growing because of AI CapEx. The labor market is only growing because of healthcare spending and social assistance the latter being a lot of home aides and administrators. Economic growth right now is basically a Friday church service, just old people and trying to summon God. And yet as good a line as that is, it's clear that Wall Street has gotten more, not less comfortable with the big spending from tech. Last week, Meta and Microsoft both announced they were putting the pedal to the metal and going as hard as possible to build out AI data centers. And when they showed up with revenue to match, it sent the stocks flying. Meanwhile, Amazon and Google weren't as clear with their message. Their AI CapEx commitment was half-hearted, and investors did not reward their conservative outlook. We've also covered Apple earnings at length, but suffice it to say that the market is not awarding consolation prizes in the AI race. So let's talk about how this market perception has shifted and what it means for the AI build-out. First of all, let's put some numbers around this. The four big tech hyperscalers, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and Meta, are collectively spending almost $400 billion on AI infrastructure just this year. For some comparatives, that's more than the EU spent on defense last year as well as around half the U.S. defense budget and more than 1% of overall U.S. GDP. Now, the journal did recognize that there are still two camps among investors, those that believe this is all a bubble that will see an inevitable unwind, and those that are happy to pour more money into the hyperscalers as long as the stock price keeps rising. And it's the scope that's really the story. This is already three times as much CapEx investment as we saw during the cloud boom. Basically, the only moment in tech history that comes close is the global deployment of fiber optic cable during the broadband wave, and of course, AI is just starting. The journal wrote, As a percentage of gross domestic product, spending on AI infrastructure has already exceeding spending on telecom and internet infrastructure from the dot-com boom, and it's still growing. Tech pundit and investor Paul Kodrowski argued that the AI investment boom is almost single-handedly keeping the U.S. economy going, acting as a kind of private sector stimulus program. Neil Dutta, the head of economic research at Renaissance Macro Research, claimed that AI CapEx had contributed more to GDP growth this year than all of consumer spending. In other words, at least at the moment, the U.S. looks more like an AI infrastructure economy than it does a consumer economy. Now, each company is attempting to show that the returns are coming. Microsoft earnings focused on their cloud revenue, which grew at 39% over the past year. They tied this directly to AI usage, with CEO Satya Nadella stating, we continue to lead the AI infrastructure wave and took share every quarter this year. Meta also linked revenue to AI with Mark Zuckerberg commenting, On advertising, the strong performance this quarter is largely thanks to AI unlocking greater efficiency and gains across our ad system. Google, although they didn't see astronomical growth in cloud, was also talking up AI as their growth story. CEO Sundar Pichai said, Obviously, we're seeing strong momentum across our portfolio and especially in cloud. It's a tight supply environment and we're investing more to expand. Now, I think it's really important to note that part of what is getting Wall Street more comfortable with this whole thing is the fact that that there does seem to be a direct line between AI investment and actual ROI. Now, that's not to say that these companies aren't forcing Wall Street into thinking in uncomfortably long-term terms. Meta, for example, is absolutely unrepentant about how much he's going to spend over time and very clearly doesn't care all that much what Wall Street does in the short term. At the same time, however, it's pretty undeniable that AI is working to improve the revenue from their ad product, and so Wall Street's on board. Now, one other really interesting takeaway from these tech earnings and this shifting narrative is that the hyperscalers are, to some extent, transitioning from bits to atoms. Writes the Wall Street Journal, There's a point in every technological cycle when engineers and inventors are rapidly innovating, 
The spoils go to those who move fast and break things, to quote 2010's era Mark Zuckerberg. We're now entering a phase in which the giants win because they own and continue to build out the physical assets that make mature technologies accessible. Point being that what it takes to win in AI is different than previous startup movements we've seen. It's not about just having crack developers. We're now talking about giant concrete structures, miles of coolant host, and endless racks of GPUs. Tech has moved away from an industry where a plucky startup can take on the incumbent to an industry where $10 billion in infrastructure is table stakes. Writes the journal, It's reminiscent of the age of business titans and robber barons who dominated railroads, steel, and other enterprises. And as happened then, today's massive companies with their ability to spend and borrow are making their moats even deeper and wider. Even formidable competitors such as OpenAI are hard-pressed to keep up. Now, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this particular show, but this cost equation does have interesting downstream effects. One of the places that we're watching most closely is the AI coding companies like Cursor. There are a lot of questions swirling around whether Cursor, despite its incredible success from a user standpoint, is able to actually serve its product on a profitable basis. Then again, it may be that right now, questioning AI profitability is a losing game. Every layer of the industry is growing at such a rapid pace that focusing on anything other than growth might just be, frankly, incorrect. Industry analyst Patrick Moorhead called what's happening now with AI planet-scale infrastructure. And frankly, the scale of the AI build-out goes a long way to explaining not just these big capex spends, but also some of the choices being made right now. For example, Zuckerberg's AI talent war doesn't make sense in the old world of software, where the value of any individual programmer or contributor is ultimately capped. In the context of AI, where a few hundred people in the world have the specific skill and knowledge to train a frontier model, that starts to look different. But even more so, when the cost of top talent is a rounding error compared to the cost of infrastructure, and if success in the AI race requires both infrastructure and a leading foundation model, then there's basically no cap on what you should spend to get those two important assets. Now, interestingly, there are two wildly divergent takes when it comes to just how much is being spent on the infrastructure build-out. Derek Thompson again writes, This is insane. AI CapEx might account for a larger share of GDP than basically any technology since the railroad. Basically, it's a mini wartime economy, but the guns are chips and the tanks are databases. Now, I will note that I'm not sure that Derek Thompson is saying insane like we shouldn't be doing it. I think he might just mean this is a profound and powerful force, and it's wild to see in black and white. However, there are plenty of people who are there thinking that this is just the most expensive tulip mania we've ever seen. On the other hand, Noam Brown from OpenAI writes, Considering the technology and the pace of progress, I think this is quite sane. Some are looking ahead to how this will play out. Chris Walker from Proximum writes, From historical precedent, here's how this will play out. Oversupply of new good, high attrition of new ventures, big economic benefit from infrastructure basically donated by financiers. Basically that the infrastructure and rails that get built now will be hugely net positive for society and the economy even if the players who install the rails aren't the ones who win. Ethan Malik points out that at this point, the amount that these companies are contributing to the U.S. economy means that prohibitive regulation is going to be very, very hard to come by. As you might expect, with more focus on this, there is more mainstream discussion of whether a crash is on the way. Noah Smith in his No Opinion blog writes, will data centers crash the economy? Noah actually says something close to Chris Walker. He writes, In both cases, referring to the telecom boom of the 90s and the railroad boom of the 1870s, quote, the big capex spenders weren't wrong, they were just early. Eventually, we ended up using all of those railroads and all of those telecom fibers and much more. He continues, this has led a lot of people to speculate that big investment bubbles might actually be beneficial to the economy, since manias leave behind a surplus of cheap infrastructure that can be used to power future technological advances and new business models. However, he says, for anyone who gets caught up in the crash, the future benefits to society are of cold comfort. He then goes on to explain how big tech companies stopping investing in these assets could cause a financial problem more than just an issue for the companies themselves. If this is something that's interesting for you guys to explore, I'll go a little bit deeper. But Noah goes way into the realm of both conjecture and deep finance, which is usually a little bit out of the scope for this show. I think what's important from my vantage point is just that this is the type of conversation that we're having now because of how clearly endemic and important this spend is to the U.S. economy as it stands at the moment. Now, as to how this all pays off, Carnegie Mellon professor of digital economy Avi Collins, alongside co-contributor Eric Brynjolfsson, wrote in the Wall Street Journals that AI was already generating nearly $100 billion in value for the U.S. Interestingly, Avi writes, AI is already generating a lot of benefits, but these benefits will not show up in GDP numbers for a while. They write, 
The U.S. economy grew at an annual rate of 3% in the second quarter, which is great news. Does that mean that AI is delivering on its long-promised benefits? No, because GDP isn't the best place to look for AI's contribution. Yet the official government numbers substantially underestimate the benefits of AI. They write that first quarter 2025 GDP was down an annualized 0.5%, while labor productivity was up a modest 2.3%. However, they argue that looking exclusively at GDP undersells the benefit. The researchers argue that Americans already enjoyed roughly $97 billion in what they call consumer surplus from generative AI tools in 2024. Quote, consumer surplus, the difference between the maximum a consumer is willing to pay for a good or service and its actual price, is a more direct measure of economic well-being than GDP. Generative AI's $97 billion in consumer surplus dwarfs the roughly $7 billion in U.S. revenue recorded by OpenAI, Microsoft, and Google from their generative AI offerings last year. It doesn't appear in GDP because most of the benefit accrues to users rather than the companies. Basically, they argue that at this stage, the benefits of this technology are accruing to the individual, not to the organization. And because they're not accruing to the organization, they're not showing up in GDP numbers. Now, that does not mean that they will never show up there, and nor does it mean that AI isn't valuable. Trying to take a step back on all of this, here are the things that have shifted. The first is that it's not a question of whether the hyperscalers are going to continue to spend on the AI build-out. There was a brief moment where it looked like Microsoft was pulling back, even though they said they weren't pulling back, and it's very clear that no one is pulling back. Second, Wall Street is increasingly comfortable with that. We're not getting the type of Goldman Sachs articles we got last year. Third, because of that, all the commentary is now moving into what it means. It's no longer just an AI question. It's not just a market question. It's a question for the economy as a whole. Now, that's not to say that this couldn't shift fast. Markets are what they are, and there are lots of factors that aren't just AI that could impact how we look at this. For now, though, AI data centers are the new railroads, and we're all just living through the AI revolution. That's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening or watching as always, and until next time, peace.